I was redlining my truck the whole entire time. Basically, some of the video footage looked like a Chevy Silverado ad. Get up that first hill, we're like, oh my gosh, we made it. Then we realized we have another downhill, another up, and uh, again, we just tried to clear it out with the four-wheeler. Started going up through there. I was flooring it as fast as I can. Started going sideways, 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 almost at the top of the hill, just stuck. All right, what is up, everybody? We got him. We got him. We got him right here. We've got Brady Miller from Go Hunt, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Mule Deer himself, and he is going to regale us with a tale of one of his hunts. Now, Brady, you're one of the most hardcore, really pretty extreme hunters that I know. Kind of one of those deals where um, if there's a mule deer out there, you'll do whatever it takes, including, like, sacrificing. I'll your sacrifice some limbs. Yeah. I, I like to say, like, I, I enjoy the suffer. I enjoy the struggle. I enjoy, yeah, everything everything it takes to take a big mule deer. I'll go and do it. So it sounds like <laughs> we have all the makings for a pretty darn good story right now, then. Yes, yes. This will be a full-on backstory of probably the coolest hunt I've ever been on. Like, yeah, there's a lot of cool hunts I've done, but, like, this one stands out just because everything that went involved in it, like, like I said, it's... It's not an easy hunt by any means. That uh, that is saying a lot. You've been on a lot of hunts. You've been on a lot of pretty wild hunts, and so for you to, for this one to like stand up, be like, oh no, dude, this, this, is, this is like this, this is the one. This I like is the about. wildest. So, and I, I and maybe I didn't mention this on the front of this podcast. This is like a Vortex Nation podcast, like storytellers edition. So, uh, like I said, Brady's gonna tell us uh, tell us a tale, a true tale. True tale. This uh, is not one of those tales that's like, oh, hunter's lying, you know, telling about big bucks that got away. It was a giant, but this is. Legit happened, and I think I, sometimes I still pay for it after what happened with my body after this hunt. All right, man. Let's, uh, let's dive in. I want to hear about this thing. Okay. So this hunt all started in, uh, you know, obviously we have to apply for it. It's, a, it's an awesome state, Colorado. And Neville and I are like, hey, man, we should do a hunt together. Let's just find an easy to draw tag. Sure. Found one. Started planning for it. Got really excited. We're, we're going to do an awesome film on it. You know, it's going to be a great time. I did a bunch of e-scouting, and I like... I always say, like, I could like start all my e-scouting efforts and then actual hunting efforts because, like, I hadn't been in this unit. So I start my really high and work my way down. And so the time frame to get everyone, ju like, a little backstory on it, it's going to be November. I believe it's, like, the almost the second week of November in Colorado. So temperatures are going to be cold. And uh, <laughs> we, we knew what the weather was going to be like ahead of time. But we're like, hey, man, we got, you know, our boots are uninsulated boots we always rock on insulated boots we figured like yeah we're gonna do much of hiking temperatures don't look brutally cold quite yet so i think we're gonna be okay but we've always thought about like ordering a bunch of pack boots but we're like yeah we don't need these pack boots so we're like yeah we're gonna we're gonna go in and uh we're gonna start high in this unit start above ten thousand feet i think we were all actually close to eleven thousand feet in november in colorado for mule deer so yeah it was a third rifle third season rifle hunt why do I feel like this this boot thing is going to play a role later? This boot thing is going to play a big role. Okay. Yep. Yep. Big, big role. So we get to the unit, like I think the day before the season opened. We're driving up through there, you know, as you always, you know, your, your excitement level is just super high and you're, we're driving through all these different, you know, sporting goods stores along the way. Like we could have prepared, we could have prepared, we could have checked, <laughs> update the weather and got some extra gear or even got some hand warmers for, for that matter, because that's also something we should have needed later. And so we kept going further and further and got finally to a spot where there's gonna be no more service anymore. Um, but like, as we checked it, the forecast coming up later in the week, it called for like temperatures of like, you know, cl close to the negative. Some days are gonna be dipping down in the negatives and town is gonna be like negative three, negative five. So I really didn't think of whatever that uh, uh, rule or law is for how many degrees of, degrees of temperature you lose as you go up, I think it's, three degrees every thousand feet or something like that like it gets colder but it's like obviously it's colorado and big weather system come in so it's gonna be a lot colder than th negative three at one point and they had actually called for in town the next day while we were hunting uh three to five inches in town so like yeah three to five inches of snow it's not gonna be a whole lot it's gonna be great deer hunting like it's gonna be phenomenal deer hunting like just great deer conditions and so as we're driving up we're like yeah you know i got i got changed from my truck and i was like thinking in my head i was like well i only have two chains. I don't, have a set, I don't have a set of chains for all four. And we're pulling a little jumping jack trailer behind that we were going to stay in. Like, because at first we're like, we're not going to backpack quite yet. We're going to go and try to have a camp up high and just assess the situation, figure out sure. where the deer are. So we start driving up the mountain, really long mountain road. We get up there, like all of a sudden we start hitting the snow line. 
I'm like, okay, there's already some snow up here. It's going to be good. It's going to be, you know, push some of the hunters out a little bit, maybe bring some of the deer down. But want to still start high at the 11,000 foot level, just see where they're at. Start driving all the way in there. We realize that, uh, hey, there's no one up here at all, not a single soul. And we're like, gosh, why is there no one up here? There's elk season going to go on tomorrow. There's also mule deer season. So we like, keep going, like we, kind of like like that spooky eerie. There's nobody eerie. up there. It's very eerie. Why is there no one up here? It's the day before the season. Maybe like, they're all going to come up tomorrow. But yeah, you're, you're generally like, sweet. There's nobody up here. Yeah, it was but awesome. But you're like, hey, there's nobody up there's here. There's nobody <laughs> up here, and it's like starting to snow. And like they said, they, you know, I grew up in Minnesota, so I know what you know. Weathermen lie all the time, so three to five inches could change. But I was like, oh, it's just going to be three to five inches. So we drive all the way up there, start setting up our camp. Uh, we actually did not use the jumping jack at that point. We decided to put up our teepee, like, because it can be a little bit more comfortable. It was me, Neville, and a camera guy. So we spent a bunch of time clearing out a bunch of snow with shovels. There's already, I don't know, five five inches of snow up there. Made enough spot for a big eight-man teepee. Cleared it all off. Got a bunch of wood going. Got a fire crank in. We're like, man, it's going to be nice tomorrow. It's going to be great hunting. And uh, we also had a four-wheeler too. So the four-wheeler was on the jumping jack, which is, also comes into play later. We had a lot of gear. We were, yeah. we were prepared basically for anything. But also, again, not prepared for everything. Right. So we had, we thought we had the essentials. So I wake up the next morning, uh, it's just dumping snow like crazy. Neville opens the door, and I think his line was like, something like, "Where's Santa?" It looks like, because basically it's like it's Christmas morning. Like, where's Santa at? Because I was like, it was like this dumping snow like crazy. Like it was, I think there was probably 15 to 20 inches of snow on the ground. I think my first line is, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. Yeah. So we're like, holy crap, there was a lot of snow. And it was just continually dumped all night on us. We had to constantly like bang off the side of the teepee, get the snow off. And literally, it was just crazy deep snow. And we're at 11,000 feet in November. And now we had that five inches plus, I think it was, like I said, 15 to 20, probably estimated. And it was drifted up a lot deeper in some other areas. Oh, my gosh. So we're up here. We're like, this is kind of scary right now. Like, it could continue to snow. Like... Oh, you get trapped. We can get totally trapped up there. So, like, let's just take the four-wheeler off the jumping jack, go drive around for a little bit on some of these roads. Because, like, I had, I had a big plan of, like, checking out a bunch of these little basins up high. And I said, like, assessing the situation, figuring out where these deer are going to be at. And I could use the four-wheeler to kind of get a little bit further. And then we start hiking and do some, like, one, two-mile hikes just to assess it. And uh, we start driving. And uh, I was like, I'm just going to go solo right now. And you guys just stay here. I just want to, like, see if we can go. And I literally got the four-wheeler stuck by myself. <laughs> As I was just driving, even though four wheel four wheel drive, you know, it's like the snow was so deep it would bury up in front of the front of the four wheeler, and just lock it, just like almost like pl- like, like just plow it into snow. Yeah, and so I'm like driving along, I'm like looking, I'm like, there's not a single deer track anywhere. There's not even an elk track. <laughs> so I'm like, if an elk can't even be up here, and a deer, even though I've seen deer, you know, belly deep snow before in some conditions, like they're just either not moving. Or there's not up here right now, and there's not a single other person. And eventually, I got to a point where like I got around that little big snow drift, kept going further. I found some other tracks coming from the other direction, but they must have came from some lower country, like maybe had private access to get onto some public access. And they never wanted to come where we were either. So I'm like, these people aren't coming here. No one's came behind here in two days now. I haven't seen any deer tracks. It's continually snowing right now. I drove back and I was like, Neville, we got to get out of here. Like this is going to get scary. There's no one up here, no one up to, else to help us. And so we wasted that full first day of hunting. I mean, though we had the teepee up, we had a bunch of wood. Our camp said it was great. You know, like, it's epic. Like, the snow is coming down. Looks like it's going to be just awesome hunt. Like, best footage ever. And then we never did any glassing that day. We're like, we got to start packing up really quickly. So we started packing up. And, uh, and that's when it kind of got really hairy. We started loading everything on the four-wheel, or loading on the, on the jumping jack. Got everything back in my truck. And we started, uh, I was like, Neville, you should take the, the four-wheeler right now, and you need to break snow in front of me because right. this trailer behind me is super heavy because it has a, a, a tent inside of it so we could stay in. And just use the four-wheeler, kind of break the path because like a bunch of snow drifts, and I like, keep running the four-wheeler up and down to kind of like pack down everything. And I thought that was kind of going to be a good idea. And then I'll follow behind with the truck, and every time you tell me to, like it's going to be hairy, just tell me to smash it. And I was in four-wheel low, chains on the, I think I had chains on the front, I can't remember if I had chains on the front or chains in the back. But anyway, we're just kind of slowly going through. We're making some stuff. All of a sudden, we get to a little area where there's a hill. And Neville's literally made a bunch of tracks, like 15 tracks, like up and down, trying to pack all the snow in. He comes down to me. He's like, I got the four-wheeler stuck again. Like, this is so deep. We're plowing snow through this. Trying, we had to kind of do a big uphill climb to get out of there. And I'm like, I turn to the camera guy. I'm like, this is going to get really bad. And I might have to... Either A, we might have to leave my truck back here, which is going to be the worst thing ever. We have to pick it up in the spring. Right. 
or B, we're going to have to ditch this jumping jack, which isn't ours. We're borrowing it from uh, Lorenzo with all this other stuff, and it's going to be rotten by the end of the year. Mice will probably go in there, and it's be nasty, and like, to be seen to dump a bunch of weight. But then it's like, where is that four-wheeler going to go? Because it can't go in the back of the truck. I had, yeah, know, that goes I, on I, top of the... It goes on top of the jumping jack, because I don't have any room in the bed of my truck to put a four-wheeler. Like, we have three guys, late-season gear. There's no way we can get the four-wheeler in all our gear. And then every day it's going to snow, it's going to destroy our gear. So, like, we have to get out of here. And then all of a sudden, these guys came driving by in a, a side-by-side, like, si- yeah, side-by-side with the full-on, like, snowmobile tracks on it. So, instead of the tires, they were the, you know, the big oh, tracks on right. it. They drove by, and they're like, what are you guys doing out here? <laughs> and we're like, yeah, we tried to deer hunt. And they're like, oh, my gosh, we saw tracks coming in. We were worried, you guys, how far deep you went in. So did they actually come up to investigate to they make sure? They were kind sure? of investigating a little bit, but they're also trying to like do a little assessing. Like, yeah, we have elk tags, and like there's still usually some elk when it gets snow like this. And they're like, we don't have any means to pull you guys out if you guys get stuck. But if you're still here tonight when we come back, we'll we'll take you to our camp and let you warm up, and we'll figure out a plan to get your guys' a vehicle out of there. And uh, so I'm like, I don't want to get stuck. Like, I don't want to. This is embarrassment to have these guys like help us out and take us back to the camp. So like, we're gonna get out of here somehow. So we had this big hill coming up and it was actually a drop down where it like was going to slam in the front of my truck and bang it up pretty good and then try to climb up this hill and that was like just floor it and floor real low just i was redlining my truck the whole entire time basically some of the video footage looked like a chevy silverado ad <laughs> it was just like truck just floor low just spraying snow everywhere the chains are like coming getting loose smacking underneath my truck as they're going get up that first hill and we're like oh my gosh we made it then we realized we have another downhill another up and uh again we just tried to clear it out with the four-wheeler Started going up through there. I was flooring as fast as I can. Started going sideways, sideways, sideways. Almost at the top of the hill. Just stuck. <sighs> just buried. Completely buried. And we're like, and I kind of got off the road a little bit because it was like, looked like it was better. Like there's actually some windblown dirt up on top. And like the actual road was all drifted over. And we're like, we just got to back down. I'm not going to be able to climb this up because the trailer is so heavy. And one point we tried to take the trailer off and it still couldn't do anything. So like we just got to go through it. So we spent like three hours or maybe even longer literally shoveling snow in this road area, trying to clear this whole area off to get my truck out of there. And it was just like the scariest situation. Ever. Cause like, I thought we'd have to leave a vehicle up there right. I literally, or that, tra- or that trailer. Like I was totally concerned. And I'm like, my gosh, we're, you know, we have to try to kill two deer. This is burning up a full day. It's probably gonna burn up tomorrow. Cause now I have to relocate. And after digging out snow for a while, I just backed up as far as I could and just floored the truck for real low again. Just, I didn't care if I burned up my whole truck. Like it was red line the whole entire time going up, sliding back and forth, got up on top and we're like, we made it. And then I ended up getting stuck like two or three more times. As we're, but then it was like going kind of downhill, but then it was, it was scary going downhill off the mountain too, because like the snow, you start to like slide a little bit off the mountain. You're like, holy crap, there's a straight drop off. Like, right. Yeah. Super, when, super scary. When you start to go, you just kind of start to go. Yeah. And then I felt bad for Neville the whole time because now it's like getting towards the afternoon. It's getting kind of dark and he's just on the four wheeler, just driving, trying <laughs> to break. Like we're in the heated truck. And he's out there on the four-wheeler, like, just breaking path. And, like, he basically drove almost all the way out, out of the mountain on the four-wheeler, just helping us in case we ever saw a vehicle, too. Because, like, I wanted to make sure some of the little hills he would always be, like, like waving, like, go really fast, go really fast, because it's going to be a little hill coming up. So, finally, we got out of that little hairy situation. And I was like, my gosh, like, <laughs> what was I thinking at first? But, like, I didn't think there would be that much snow. But then I had the crazy idea the next day, like, hey, let's just go to this other area I know about, check it out. And we're going to park down below again. And then we're just going to take the four-wheeler and go all the way up and assess the situation up on top and glass some of that country we wanted to look at from this other. So basically now we're relocated around the mountain and then, like I said, glassing that terrain I wanted to get to from that other area. Okay. But now it's going to, the problem is if we wanted to hunt from here, it's going to be like six, seven miles of hiking to get over there before it's going to be a lot easier. That's why I want to do the higher up and then come this way. Gotcha. So now we're looking up into the high country. We set up there. Um, only for, this is like we said earlier, like I literally set up, put my binos up, boom, buck. Like we, we there was a lot of snow in that area still big in the morning, but I found the buck right away in this little basin that we want to check out. I'm like, this is going to be really good. I turned to Neville and I was like saying like, you want to hunt mule deer? You don't want to do it? You go high. Like I was like, you just got to go high, get away from the people. And that's where this deer was. He was at, it was about 10,000 feet still, but, in, but it was an area there was no way to get a vehicle from the other way. So we had to drop down this basin, you know, go hike up there. But here's this giant deer. He had matching kickers off both sides. Just a, a stud of a buck. Like, not a big scory deer, but just a classic-looking mule deer. Big bladed tines, mass, a deer you'd be happy just to take. cool, big old buck. Just running around in the snow. Like, he, I can't remember if he was rutting yet or not, but I know he had some other smaller bucks with him. And we're like, how are we going to make a play in this deer? And this was, like, day two. So I'm like, 
actually we didn't lose a lot of time on this hunt because of all the stuff that went on. And uh, this, so this deer ended up going down, ended up working through these a bunch of trees. We're like, yeah, maybe we should work away right now, try to go after them. Maybe we should wait a little bit. And all of a sudden he starts like just coming right towards us. I'm like, hey guys, like this is gonna work out. This deer's coming right at us. We're up on this big glassing knob and he's literally working down all the way through all this oak brush, this oak brush mess. I'm like, how'd this deer even find a way to get through this thick oak brush? He's just coming right towards us and just leaving a giant path of snow behind him because there's tons of snow in the area. And I'm like, we're gonna get a shot at this buck, guys. Like, and since I glassed it up, and I was like, we made a pack out. So whoever glasses it up first, yeah, sure. we'll usually go after it because like that way you stay honest with your glassing and you'll have someone who's lazy and not like glassing properly. And then I end up finding a deer for Neville and he might not look or he finds a deer and it's mostly my turn, but like whoever finds a deer first can either pass it up or shoot it. So it's like, it's, it was my, de- my deer. If I want to take it, and I was like, yeah, it's got big kickers. Like the kickers, like three inch, three inch, four inch kickers. And I've never killed a buck like that. Yeah. And this is the second day. And I'm like, this is going to be awesome. And I'm like, but we have to, we probably have to drop down a hundred yards to get this clear opening because it's going to be easier to shoot from right there. I'm a little more flat bench. And let's try to slip down there a little bit. So we started slipping down there as this buck kind of coming towards us. I didn't think he could see us because there's kind of some trees in front of us, some of the like TJ type stuff. Start slipping down there. All of a sudden I turn back at one point. I see my camera guy. I told him about this a lot, but I was like really mad at the time. <laughs> <laughs> his, name, his, name, his name matter. He's a, the, the most talented guy you've ever met. Makes all of our films, all of our video. And I saw him like standing up, like getting some cool like B-roll. And right. I, I was like, we were both like low going down the hill, like trying to stay out, of, trying to not skyline ourselves. And there's Mather like standing up on top of the hill, doing a bunch of B-roll. And then we get down to the spot. I pull up, the, like lay down my pack really quickly. And then like I thought that in the head, like that deer was probably looking at my camera guy standing on top of the hill, trying to get some cool shots. And you can't blame the guy because that's what he was there to do. He's right. really there to take video. And he wanted to capture that scene, how it was, because it was such an epic scene. <laughs> and then right when I lay down, like, Neville's like, the buck's alert, buck's alert. He's looking at us. And I, like, quickly ranged him. I was like, it's, it's like 450 yards or whatever. It's like a shot I could make. But then the buck, like, just turns around. And he's like, I was, like, trying to do, adjust my turret. And I finally got back on the gun. He's like, he's running. He's gone. Oh. And the buck had literally been watching us that whole time after, like, we started making that stock down. And I think he might have saw the camera guy. I can't blame him fully. But I was definitely mad. At one point I turned around. I was like, hey, man, I think he busted that buck out. And he was like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, I was just kind of down. So I'm probably saying something stupid that I shouldn't have been right. saying. But, like, the buck takes off running. And I'm like, ugh. But then, like, oh, that's just, just, like, so heartbreaking. Especially you know? after everything that happened the day before, a giant kicker buck. Right. And literally, he came from, like, I think it was, like, two miles away or something. Like, that. we spotted him and came all the way to us. Like, it never works out that way. I was going to say, that's just one of those things you're like, this is not going to happen again. Not going to happen. The deer came right to us. And, like, we were going to get smash a giant deer in the second day. Ugh. And the snow, all the cool things I want after everything we struggled on the next day. And then we sat around there glassing for a little bit. And uh, what, what happened that evening? I think we stayed there the whole evening, went, uh, went back to camp that, that day. We had, we had a bunch of guys that were kind of near us. And uh, they, they invited me over to their camp because we were just camping in lower country and then kind of going back up. Okay. They invited us over, started showing a bunch of pictures. They're like, oh, you're Brady. Like, great to see you. I like, can't believe you're hunting in the same spot we did. And they, you know, welcomed us in. They had actually had a wall tent down below. So it was really nice to go in their wall tent compared to our little teepee setup. Oh, that is nice. Yeah. And uh, so that night we kind of swapped stories, told them everything. And they're like, yeah, we saw you guys up there. You guys going back there in the morning. I was like, yeah, we're going back up there. But there's plenty of room. You guys could, should totally come up there and hunt too. Like, it's not totally my spot. It's not totally your spot. This is all public land. Like, have at it with us. So the morning we kind of drove up there again after we parted ways with them, slept in our cold teepee again, even though we did have some wood, but it was still a cold night. Yeah. And then got all the way back up there in the morning, started glassing. I found this buck on this big rim rock like area, like further up on the mountain again, still above 10,000 feet. And I was like, I turned over to the guys like, we need to go back down, gather all our gear. And we're going to go back, back in for these deer. Cause they're just too far for us to work at. Like if we drop down this, this big cliff area, hike all across all this big oak brush flat, navigate all these cliffs like it, we're just gonna not be able to do it in one day and be able i was to come gonna say back. even just like safe like safety, safety you need to have that stuff with you yeah and so like i think it's good hair if we go all the way over there and it's a long distance too it was like i don't know four miles we were glassing or three miles probably we were glassing these deer but to get over we need to camp and probably make it play on them it's going to be a long hike we have to work all around avoid the deer get over there and then these other guys pulled up with the four-wheeler started talking and uh um, they, were, they were like looking at some deer over in some private and I was like why do you guys keep looking over the deer in private like oh they're really big deer and it's like well you can't hunt them you know and it's like they're super cool guys but they were just there's like we told them later like hey this is our plan we're gonna go do this so if you see these quads up here you guys can still hunt everywhere else but we're just gonna let you know we're gonna go all the way across they're like you guys are doing what it's November right now <laughs> and literally there's a there's a cold front coming in it's gonna get that below zero temperatures and we're like yeah we're gonna go backpack all the way over there 
and just camp over there. Like, yeah, you guys have at it. Like, I don't even know if they saw the deer that we were looking at, but we're like, hey, I see anything good. We did the old like hunter lie. Like, yeah, you know, we had, we're seeing some things, you know, but nothing, you know, nothing worth going after. But we're gonna go over there and check it out. But yeah. Yeah, n- nothing. I mean, nothing too great. I mean, we are going to go risk our lives, but yeah, yeah. So we, if you think we're going to risk our lives, we're probably going to go over there for something really big. And it was actually a really big deer that I saw. And I was like, that's why we have to go back there because like all those deer are coming from these like big dark timber cliffs that are behind there, and they're just kind of working their way out some of this open stuff. Like that's why we have to go back there. So we went back down, grabbed all our gear, came back up on the four wheel trail, parked the four wheeler, and then like started our. Uh, it turns out to be an almost a death march to go in there because we didn't know what we we're going to get ourselves into. Right. And we had some gear to go backpack hunting, but again, we had non-insulated boots. <sighs> Neville uh, made the mistake of taking his uh, little water bladder and oh. having it having it on the back of his backpack the whole time. Because like, yeah, I just can't fit it in my backpack because our backpacks are so full with the, with the food, other water, and all the insulation layers. Like, we literally had like. I think I had two down pants with me, two or three down jackets, plus everything else, like mittens, gloves, all this sort of backup gear, and of course our weapons and optics. And we start hiking all the way down through there. And of course we all wear too many layers at first, and so we're starting ditching layers. Like, man, it actually is kind of hot out right now. And we get all the way over to our spot for the evening where the kind of the buck was earlier. We're like, let's just set up here really quickly and see if he comes out in this little this little open park area. And I turn, I look around at Neville, and I'm like. Uh, Neville, you might want to look at your water right now. And he's like, what? What's about my water? And uh, his whole water was, water bottle was completely frozen. Yep. It was rock solid. And I was like, that's the issue too, because up there was no water. And so like, he obviously had something in his, in his uh, backpack for the evening, but like, we'd have to melt that later because all the snow that was up there and we were getting was powder snow. It had no water content in the snow. So it wasn't like that nice, you know, you can scoop it up and you actually could like kind of just shake it for a while and you actually get some water content or easily melt. This is powder snow, which does not have any water. So anytime you melt powder snow, like you can melt the whole thing of like a giant uh, stove full of, or a cup, you know, use your backpacking MSR or whatever it is. Yeah. And it will have water content of like one inch on the bottom. It could be full of snow at first and it breaks one inch of water down the bottom. So you're starting that, dumping that in more snow, making more, more of it. Like it's a painful process. I'm like, we have to, we have to make sure we can melt that, that bladder tonight because you don't need the water for tomorrow. And then we sat there in the snow waiting for this buck to come out and hoping he would. And of course, he does like big bucks do. They never come out. We never saw a single deer. Never saw a single deer in the evening at all. We're like, oh, oh. Are these, are these deer still here? Like, we're sitting in the snow, totally freezing. And the problem is, too, we're like, we're all sweaty earlier, which is kind of a little bit dangerous because we all just hiked up there. And we were luckily wearing like less layers, but we were both just freezing cold. And I think uh, both Neville and my camera guy, Mather, had forgot a glassing pad. Oh, no. Yeah. So, like, glassing pad in the snow, if you don't know, like, it's essential because it's an insulation layer on top of the snow. So, you're going to stay a little bit warmer and you also stay drier and not getting wet every day. So, they're just sitting in the snow, freezing cold with their down pants on the outside. So, their down pants are now wet and everything just gets wet every single time yeah. we go glassing. And even though they did have rain gear, but, like, rain gear eventually is going to get a little wet and it's just going to get cold from sitting on that stuff. So, now it's dark out. Now we're, like, I had some spots marked from my, my e-scouting efforts. Like, I think this is a flat area. I think we can go camp over here. I don't know what the wood situation is. And now we have to think about the wood as well because we need we need that wood for the teepee because of a teepee with a lightweight stove. So we hike around in the dark. Unfortunately, we don't know where we're going besides for like we have this general waypoint area marked. Finally get over there and to like, I don't know what kind of magic this was, but there was a spot where there was a big trying to kind of like dead tree mm-hmm. and in front of it was all wind blown and it was actually not a lot of snow right there and i was like oh, oh nice how, like all the snow was like obviously down below or, or, or pushed off where we got our truck stock stuck but like there's actually a spot where it was like pretty open so we didn't have to do a lot of clearing off with the snow we pitched our teepee right there and like uh, next to it was a big giant cliff we could tell like 20 yards behind us was a giant cliff so we're like okay we don't want to go that way in the dark because it's a giant cliff over there but we're going to go edge of the cliff with a bunch of burned trees grab a bunch of timber and actually all the wood in there was dead. So it was like that stuff you could just grab oh, and like just pull it really quickly. And then when you walk over to camp, you can just like stomp it with your foot and it breaks really easy. And then it actually broke and uh, some sizes that are like could fit in the, the stove right away. So you don't have to do a lot of sawing. Mm-hmm. So I always try to avoid sawing because like that's a nice way to warm up twice, you know, because you warm up while you're cutting up the wood and then you warm up later. But like we just had so much firewood too, which is like made things great because we knew it's going to get really cold the next couple of days. Oh, yeah. So literally, we just put, pushed the teepee. We are spending all this time cutting wood. I probably cut wood to like, I don't know, three, four hours, five hours into the darkness, like literally going down to get more wood, bring it up. Like we had a giant stack, like as big a stack we could. So we wanted it all in there. We wanted to dry it out as quick as we can. Yeah. 
So that night, you know, we're sitting in there contemplating our, our life decisions right now. And, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, are we going to see any deer? Because we still hadn't seen a deer since we've been up there. And while we were hiking in the dark, we never saw any deer tracks. We did see deer, you know, that below that rim rock area. So they were there, that big deer we saw the day before. Like, yeah, I think we're going to find some deer. Let's, you know, work this, work this area really hard, check all these dark timber spots every single day. And, you know, we're just going to try to survive while we're up here. Like, that was the main goal is, like, we have to try to survive but be smart. That's why we need to melt a bunch of water tonight. That's why we had that, we had that teepee so hot, we were almost down to our T-shirts because we just kept putting wood in there, putting wood in there because we had to constantly melt all that snow on top of the stove. Gotcha. To fill up all our analogies, fill up all our water bladders. And so we were joking, like, like how hot it was in there and like you go outside to grab more snow and you're just like instantly frozen yeah you're like shut that teepee shut that teepee because it's just bringing yeah. up and like those teepees don't hold a lot of heat in there either right so once we're like we're like we just gotta keep this thing as hot as we can for as long as we can because later on that night it's gonna get really cold and unfortunately i'm always a person who like ends up sit sleeping i guess it's a benefit too sometimes right next to the front entry of the stove so i'm always a person who has to stoke the fire throughout the whole night right and i'm a person who can sleep through anything like like a big loud noise could go off or whatever. Someone could come into my house and I wouldn't even realize it because I'm like sleeping. Right. Like I sleep and I sleep. But they're always like, oh, it's getting really cold in here. Can you like stoke the fire? Or like, I tried to like, you know, set a couple alarms for every like two hours, three hours to like stoke the fire a little bit more. And in the morning, like obviously we didn't have the fire going for that long. We all wake up and like, we need a fire before we can go out hunting. Like oh, yeah. the whole tent is now like ice because all the condensation on the inside. Our boots are actually rock solid, even though they're in the teepee because that little time it was um, the, te- the stove was out, our boots froze. Right. So I get the wood going, get the stove going, start melting a little bit more snow. And it's still like dark out, but now we're like, um, do we really want to go outside, guys? Because <laughs> like it was so cold. And they were like, yes, yeah, so let's just put every single layer on we had. Like I, like I said, I think I had two down pants, three down jackets. Like we literally look like the, the Michelin like tire commercial guy, like just this big dude with tons of clothes on. And we're like, the only thing we have to watch out for is let's like, let's just be cautious of how like fast we hike. Right. Because we don't want to start sweating and have to make much more fire. So we are walking really slowly as we're hiking through the woods, just trying to like still hunt a little bit, trying to like see if there's any tracks. We sat down, did some glassing. Again, didn't see any deer. We're like, again, contemplating, was this actually worth it? But we, I should back up a little. The first place we checked was that canyon that was right next to camp, that big, big cliff area. Okay, right. Big cliff area. We checked that like every morning. Um, that morning didn't have any deer, unfortunately. And then we started working around this rim area, started going out there. And like, it was like maybe an hour into the morning. Then I look at each other, like, you cold? And I'm like, yeah, I'm cold. It's like, want to start a fire? And I was like, yeah, we should probably start a fire right now. Like it was barely into our hunt. And we're like already thinking about starting a fire. Cause like everything is cold on us. Oh my gosh. At one point he was like, pull out that range finder, see how far that like, the Canyon was across. And I was like, pulled it out, ranged it. And I put my hands back in. I was like, dude, my hands were already cold. just from being out trying to range really quickly. Like it is scary cold. Like. I don't exactly know what the temperature was. I really wish I knew the exact temperature, but it was cold. I mean, that is, I mean, that is spooky because, I mean, it just doesn't take much for that to go south. No. And, like, then the area we were at, too, like, again, we had to conserve all our fire starter. We had a bunch of, you know, Vaseline-soaked cotton balls. Um, we had a bunch of other, you know, different fire starting methods. But, like, we wanted to really conserve those and save those for the teepee because that's when we need to make our water at night. Mm-hmm. So during the day, we were like, yeah, let's try to, you know, start a fire old school method way, you know, just using maybe a little bit of toilet paper, a little bit of stuff we had with us. I think we actually did bring some newspaper with us, too, because we, oh, I had, like, a hunting magazine I grabbed from a sporting goods store, so we were, like, burning out the pages of the hunting magazine. It was actually, like, a paper hunting magazine. Okay. Like one of, I don't know if it was a hunting magazine, but, like, a newsletter pamphlet thing. Okay. So I brought a bunch of that stuff up there. And uh, so then we were, like, looking around, like, dang, all there are right around us right now are aspen trees. Mm-hmm. And aspen trees... Maybe it's somewhere else, but they don't burn at all. Like, they're not very good. And these are, like, dead aspen trees. If we pull a bunch of branches off it, and trying to get a fire start with aspen is not very, very good at all. Like, I think it, once it finally goes, it kind of burns really quickly, but it's hard to light. Finally found some other stuff to make a fire. We're sitting on the fire. All of us are, like, taking naps right away. It's like, <laughs> we got to start hunting somehow. And so then we later on, we're like, we need to start positioning these fires more closer to the areas we're going to be hunting so we can just, like, sit next to a fire and glass. Okay, right. Yep. And, uh... And then, like, I think that was the day we, we made that first fire with the aspen trees. That was when we woke, or Neville woke up once and was like, holy crap, like, all these elk had just, like, ran by us, like a whole herd of elk. There's actually some guys that have, must have rode up on horseback, pushed all these elk around us, and now we had a bunch of elk tracks everywhere. And, again, we're like, there's still no deer tracks. We haven't seen a deer yet. And we just, like, finally woke up, went and did our evening glassing thing. Didn't see a single deer again in the evening. Uh, maybe we saw some does or some small bucks, but I can't remember right now. We're like, again, dis- discouraged as we're going back to camp. Like, what's tomorrow going to like do? Like, we all, today was all cold. 
Didn't see very many deer. Had that big elk herd come in. We don't know if there's pressure from like elk hunters now up there with us because they're on horseback. Maybe they have a cozy wall tent that we should probably go like, <laughs> yeah. hey, you guys want some, uh, I don't know what we can give them, some food for, you know, some warmth in the wall tent. But they went back to camp that night. They're doing the same thing again. You get back to camp, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, you can finally relax. But that's when the work really started for us because, again, we had to grab more wood. We burned so much of it last night. We start doing the water situation again. And we had one point at night where it was, I thought it was going to be a scary situation for a little while. We are you know, melting our snow with both our uh, little backpacking stoves on top of our, our main titanium stove. All of a sudden, the loudest pop ever happens in the teepee. Like, literally, it sounded like a gun went off. Okay. Just like a big bang. Just like very, very loud. Like our ears were ringing. We're like, what the heck was that? Did like, was there a, a, a cartridge on the stove that like blew up? Like, this, like all like, of our guns were definitely unloaded. We always checked that right away. But like, did it, was something touching there? Yeah, like loud, loud. Loud, loud. Like scary, scary loud. And then we look around for a little bit. All of a sudden we found a piece of a, a, a lighter. The, no way. So Neville has a little like sleeve on his little, little backpacking stove where he always sticks his lighter. Oh. And while we were melting snow, like the other night we were just using my stove, or he just put it in there, that thing got so hot that that lighter full of lighter fluid got just hot and just burst. And oh it's like gosh. made the loudest noise. Like it literally sounded like a gunshot. It like, probably was. I mean, you got literally like fuel, like yeah, powder, fuel. like encased. Encased and all that pressure. Yeah. And eventually just blew up. And we're, like, like at first we were all like, did we get shot by someone <laughs> else? Did we shoot? Like, Is we everybody know, okay? Is everybody okay? And we're like our ears are just ringing and we're like that was weird and now we're down to and now we lose a lighter yeah that's another scary thing so luckily i always carry two lighters i think neville only had one on this trip and i do have some backup like safety matches but i'm like now we're down a lighter right so like what if one of our lighters gets wet that sort of thing and we can't use it anymore so like now it's kind of like hey this is gonna get real and then again the next day we start going out again we do the same thing in the morning we check that little canyon that's right next to us this mm-hmm. canyon comes into play later this is a good good thing to know so this canyon, we finally found some deer in there, but there was just small little runt bucks and a bunch of does. But I liked the look of the canyon, even though it was right next to camp, which was really crazy to me because we're bre- every night we're breaking all the sticks. Yeah. We have our headlamp shining everywhere. And like I said, that, that canyon is only like 20 yards away, but it literally drops straight down and then goes off for like 500 yards. It's like a really good canyon with some dark timber and stuff like that. But every day we wanted to check it. We want to check that front area. We're seeing those deer again. Still, I saw some small bucks. We're like, hey, we're starting to see some deer. You know, that's a good sign. They're, they're in here. Like we saw them earlier. We know they're still here. And I believe it was still snowing off and on some of these days. And some of these days were really clear now because it was getting that uh, really cold point. I think t- uh, this day was actually the one day it was completely sunny. That's why it was super, super cold this day. Okay. So this is the day we're just hiking around again, like Michelin men being really, really slow, careful. We set up this one area, start glassing. I'm like, hey, I got, I got some elk. And I look, and Neville pulls up. He's like, there is a lot of elk. Like, it was probably the biggest elk herd I've ever seen out in front of us. Wild. And uh, neither, neither of us, because... We just want to hunt mule deer, and none of us bought an, an over-the-counter elk tag. Yeah, uh, why would you? Yeah, and Neville looks and is like, oh, my gosh, there's, a, there's bulls. And I'm like looking like, there's a lot of bulls. And I'm like, there's some good bulls in here. They're can all you, bedded can on- you buy them online? Can yeah. you get, like, does anybody have service? Yeah, they were all bedded on this hillside in the sun, just like soaking up the sun. Oh, my gosh. And just, I think, that, I think some of them were like 900 yards away. Like, we easily could have made a stock on them and shot a couple of these bulls. And we're like, thinking like, we're idiots, like... Like, we, we, again, we drove by all those sporting goods stores, you know. The only one we had to stop at was getting our, like, ATV permit. And then, like, why didn't, we, why didn't, why didn't one of us pick up an elk tag? We could have an elk down. Because, like, we didn't think we were going to get deer at this point because we hadn't seen a lot of deer. Right. But here's all these bulls. All of a sudden, someone comes up over the hill, and they're on horseback. We can see them on the ridge line. We're like, this is going to kind of be fun to watch. And so, someone drops down. We heard a shot crank off. One of the bulls fell over. Okay. I don't think they could see the whole herd. They didn't know all those bigger bulls were there. But then we later find out, we think it was a, a really young kid who actually shot one of the bulls because, like, they got off their horse later. This, we saw some kid, like, jumping up and down. Like, he was the one who was, like, or I don't know, he was he or she, but grabbing the antlers and, like, behind the take of the awesome. picture. So it was, like, it was a really cool experience. We got to see someone actually shoot an elk. And we're up there freezing, and they're obviously in horses. They're horses. They could tell, like, when I put my spotter on, I'm like, this horse is, like, covered in, like, you know, frozen, like, I'm ice sure, and everything. just like the, yeah, the cup, the whatever, they're, like, from their breath. It's their just breath, like, yeah. <laughs> and it was, like, really cool to see. So, like, they got a bull. There's probably no deer there now because they just shot, and there's someone actually up here with us. But then we're like, let's go still hunt this area, you know, kind of where some deer were before when we were glassing that longer distance away from the mm-hmm. quads. We start still hunting. It's sort of, like, kind of flat area, kind of rolling topography with some aspen trees and some good looking like timber strips that I think the deer might be bedded in. 
I was going to start walking through there, and uh, I don't know if Neville or I saw it first, but we, like, we saw some ears poking up in the snow. Okay. It's so, like, there's some deer up here with us. And like, all of a sudden it looks like, oh, there's a buck over there. And down below, he's like, actually, there's a big buck. Like, I don't know, 160 type buck. Oh, yeah. A buck that Neville was totally great to shoot. And he's like, I'll, I'll take that buck. Like, we haven't seen anything up to this point. Like, we're shooting. He's like, I want that deer. And I think at this point, too, Neville had never taken a mule deer, too. And so that's like, a, that was a cool part of this story, oh my gosh, too. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So he was like, all jacked to go to Colorado to experience this and then take a mule deer, especially in these conditions. And we're like, let's go after that deer. And we start stalking through this. And it was like open terrain, but like there's a little bit of trees. And we start moving our way down towards there. And the deer, I don't I can't remember if the winds were, I swear we had the wind right. Maybe we didn't. But also we're starting to get closer. And there was some does bedded down that kind of jumped up and ran. We like, they ran the opposite way. Maybe the wind swirled though. Neville was getting like, we're like, all right, we need to like, get ready to take a shot. Let's probably drop down, like figure out we can get some ranges. And we drop down, get ready to shoot. Buck just takes off. We're like, like just goes. Just goes. And I like, I, I, so I said right now, I, I do remember, I think we had the wind exactly perfect. It was like coming at our face, going, blowing the opposite way. But the buck forever he just took off and ran over this little hill. I mean, that's just, it's crazy that he was like that spooky. Like he didn't stand up and he just kind of look like, like there's no, relatively, there's nobody up there's there. There's nobody up there. Like you probably haven't seen anyone in weeks. Right. He has no reason to believe that and something the, is afoot. And the, this, you know, the, the luscious smell of the rut is beginning yes. to be in the air. So he should have been hanging around these does a little bit harder. But the does kind of, I think some of the does did stand there and he'd like just, you know, meandered off like a, like a smart old deer. But he's yeah. Like, and I was like, gosh, dang it. Like, there goes that chance. We turn around, start hiking back. Like, we should, you know, still hunt again back towards the, the towards camp. We'll check out some of these more little spots. And again, we ran into another deer. This is a bigger deer. Okay. So like, all right, we got deer now, guys. Like, this is going to be a really good hunt. And uh, I'm like, yeah, these deer are really close. Like, we should just drop down right now. We're going to belly crawl like 50 yards, get set up. It's getting dark now too, which is kind of coming into play. And uh, so, how like, far away are you from like camp then? Oh, we're only like a half mile from camp. Okay, well that's I, good. Yeah, really close to camp. Yep. Yeah. But it's just like, gosh, why is it you know getting dark and we have a deer right now? And we want to be able to stop closer. Like, let's just drop right now. And we'll try to shoot this deer because it's within range if we just go 60 yards closer, 50 yards, whatever it was, so we can get above this little rise and actually see where these deer were. We get set up. Um, Neville lays down. I can't remember what kind of bipod he had, but it wasn't tall enough to lay down in the snow because the snow was so deep. So the bipod just boom, burying in yeah. there. And then at one point he, he put his gun in there to try to lay down the bipod. And here's the mistake he made, which because he was very new at rifle hunting too, because he's from Iowa. Okay. Like bow hunted all, all the time and just getting in the rifle game. So he didn't tape his barrel. And somehow I didn't notice he didn't tape his barrel. And when he went to set this bipod down, I think his bipod actually gave out from underneath him and the barrel went right into the snow. So he's turned around to me like, hey, the, the, my barrel is full of snow. I can't, I cannot shoot this deer if I wanted to right now. Like, what do I do? And he's like trying to blow on. He's using his hand to grab on it. And oh, again, no. like time is running out because like it's starting to get darker. And I'm like, unscrew your brake right now. We unscrewed his brake, blew on it, actually got the, the snow out because it was just in the brake. Luckily, it wasn't in the, in the barrel. But probably, I don't, I'm hesitant to say you could have shot through that. But to my mind, we should do the animal justice and not shoot because I could have maybe impacted it and made it go right or left or you just totally would have missed. So it was like the safe thing to do. Yeah, and I know how hard that snow was, what's pressure wise and everything. Because I've shot with, you know, electrical tape on and duct tape and that'll blow off a barrel. But oh, like, yeah. like, let's just do the safe thing. But <laughs> hindsight was my gun was laying right next to me. <sighs> Why didn't I just take the sleeve off my gun and just Shoot hand this. him my gun and said we wasted whatever five, ten minutes of like doing that. But again, heat of the moment. We have a deer in front of us. We hadn't seen many deer. Like none, neither of us were thinking straight. Right. And obviously he shouldn't have, you know, made his bipod fall down there. And then he like, cause his bipod wasn't tall enough. He's like, we laid down one backpack. Tried to shoot off the backpack. He's like, I need another backpack. It's not, it's not tall enough. So I gave him another backpack. And this is where like his, whole, his hands are out of his uh, mittens this whole time during this process too. And this is a very important part because like he's, you know, trying to shoot this deer. He had to take the muzzle brake off. He's making sure he had ammo in there. And now he's grabbing these backpacks. His hands in the snow. He's getting wet. And he keeps laying there. He's like, I need another backpack. So I think we grabbed all three of our backpacks, like mine, camera guys, and Neville's try to stack them up. And this deer keeps going up on this little ridge. Looking around for a little bit, boom, going back down, kind of chasing some doe. So he's like, I can't shoot. The deer's down. And I'm like, all right, here comes a deer. And he's like trying to look. He's like, I can't see the deer. I don't know where it is. It's getting, you know, kind of darker and it's all hectic deer moving everywhere. And we're like, okay, you can't shoot now if you can see it because now there's a doe in the way. Now the deer's going back down below the little hill. And the deer's just, now it's like too much of a rut activity. Like we've been waiting for the rut the whole time and now there's too much rut going on. Right. And his hands are still outside in the elements, just on, on the metal part of, you know, the lower part of the action there. And it's like, touching his barrel and all that stuff and then finally like 
can't remember how long this went on, but it was like a cat and mouse thing. Where I like, deer show up, go back down, gear show up, and I find them like it's, it's we can't hunt anymore. It's getting too dark. Camera lights gone too, so we have to just pack it up. And then he slowly he was like, "Gosh, that was exciting! I can't believe I, I you know, I couldn't get a shot off, whatever." It's like, but well, these deer are near camp, like they're close to camp. We'll hunt them in the morning. We'll probably find them. I don't think we spooked them. They're just like running back and forth. And then he turns to me and like just starts like, like kind of like yelling like, "Oh my gosh, my hands! Like my hands are like I can't feel my fingers. I literally can't feel my hands right now." He's like, "Not just his fingers. It was like part of his whole hands. He couldn't feel anything on it." Oh my gosh! So he's just literally yelling in pain. Like trying, he's trying not to yell too loud because he knows his deer are still here. But he's like, "I can't feel my my hands." Like probably saying some things, you know, some 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 words you wouldn't say around like your, your family. Like my hands just hurt so bad. Right. Right. And I'm like, I don't know what to do right now. I was like, I tried. To get, I had a hand warmer. I grabbed my hand warmer and started like shaking it. I was like, those things take forever to activate. Like mm-hmm. it wasn't like instant heat, but I, like tried to keep in my jack for a little bit. He's literally rolling in the snow. Like not just like sitting there, like leaning back and forth when you're cold. He's literally rolling back and forth in the snow. Like I can't feel my hands. I can't feel my fingers. Like, I mean, it's, it's so, cause I've probably, well, I know like not that extreme, but you know, like white tail hunting or even, you know, some Western hunts, like, and I think I'm prone to getting cold hands. And like when they go, like, Number one, super numb, super painful. And actually, it's even just as when you start to get them back, it's incredibly painful then, too. Yeah. So, like, this is all this stuff's going on, just craziness. And, like, I'm like, how are we going to warm him up later? How are we going to do this? Like, is he going to be okay? Like, so he's like just rolling on the snow. Finally, he's like, I think I'm getting good. I think I'm getting good. He's like, all right, let's just go back to the teepee, get warmed up. Like, we have to just do something to get you warm. Like, you just stay in the teepee, get warm. I'll start, like, try to light the fire. And, like, his hands were so cold, he couldn't, like, zip up his jacket further he couldn't like grab his like i think his mittens had some zipper on the backside. he couldn't zip that all his fingers were just done and like i think he said the next day like he did have some like little white spots kind of forming on his fingers like look like frostbite type thing he's like they're really cold but i can i can do stuff stop doing stuff now but like that's kind of scary for a little bit just like not knowing we're way back in here too like we can't just go get help we can't just go you know all we have is a fire right there which luckily we can you know get warm that way but it's again, it's like the struggle of every single day. And he had two opportunities right to take a shot at deer and none of them came to fruition. Like, are we ever going to have another opportunity like this? We haven't seen a lot of deer at this point, but now we're kind of starting to see some deer. And uh, so we wake up the next day, same thing again, clear skies, super cold. And we're like, all right, we got to take it slowly. Make sure we don't sweat. We check out that cannon one more time. We did see some more small deer in there. Probably the same ones we saw the day before. Mm-hmm. Does and small bucks. We're like, gosh, there's nothing, you know, these little bucks are thinking they're running, thinking they're a top dog, but like they can't be the top dog in the area. No. There's something else got to be going on here. Like we saw a good mature deer the other day, that one giant deer right away. It's like, where has that giant deer been? Right. So like, that's the reason we came over. He was an absolute giant. And it was so far away. It was hard to tell exactly how big it was. Like that deer had a big frame. That's why we're here right now. We checked out that spot, and we're like, we did the same big loop again, checking all these canyons, doing all this stuff. And again, we, we every, like every day we were making more bonfires. This time we're getting smarter where we position our bonfires because like we had to fire like right next to where we can glass. Perfect. And then so we're starting getting really good at doing that. You know, starting to have some like more excitement. Like we're getting a little bit more life in us. We're starting to see deer. You know, we're starting joking around, like taking some of our food and setting it on the the fire during the middle of the day, trying to like warm it up and like grabbing it. It's like, oh, it's really hot, but it's like it feels good. It's really hot. <laughs> right. Oh, it's so scalding. <laughs> yeah. And then we're glassing again. Found a bunch more elk. Found a bunch more deer way off. And we're like, all right, we just let's do. Should we do that loop again that we did yesterday? Just like go still hunt for a little bit. And it's not like a true still hunt, I wouldn't say, but we're just like slowly walking and kind of like you know checking out things as we're as we're moving right. through. So right. Right. And so we say, yeah, let's just, let's just give up this afternoon hunt, kind of work our way back towards camp, go back to camp area, maybe check out the, the front area where we were glassing that first day with the quad or check out that canyon we've been seeing every morning. So start looping back around, walking over, check, checking out towards that. We got right to the, to the teepee. I think Neville might have dropped something or sets his backpack down or something like that. And we're like, let's just walk out to the, the edge of that cliff and let's check it out. We've never glassed it in the evening. Yeah. So this is the first time, like, hey, let's try something new. We got to shake things up a little bit. It's getting towards the end of the hunt. I think it was... The second to the last day. Yeah. At this point, we had maybe had one full day of hunting left or maybe a day and a half of hunting left. So we check out that canyon. We, we walk over there. Like, instantly I saw some does. I'm like, hey, there's deer in here, guys. And, uh, of course, like, this is why I sometimes really love having camera guys. They're eagle eyes. Right. They don't have any optics on, but they can spot animals. We're always, like, looking, like, way far, far away with our binos or spotters, and they're always looking close. Right. So where those deer were, there's actually another deer down below. I like, I think I see a buck. I'm like, all right. Like... That's good, that's good, man. I just saw the does at first. So I pull up my bind, and, and I'm like, oh, that's a big deer. Like that, I think that, that's the, the deer from the first day. Or okay. Like the second day when we were, like, glassing up on top of the quads. 
and I turned to Neville, and he's like, he's like, what should we do? And he's like, because neither of us really spotted the deer. I spotted the does, but I think the camera guy spotted the buck. And uh, Neville's like, I can't take that shot because there's no way I can get comfortable. I don't know how to do that right now because he's not really experienced in rifle shooting. So like, this is all on you. Do whatever you need to do. You can take this deer because we need to get a deer down because we've been up here struggling the whole time. Right. So if you think you can do it, do it. And luckily the deer was in a spot because like I said, that canyon wasn't very far, but it was a super steep drop down cliff area. Mm-hmm. And then this goes out in a little like area with a bunch of dark timber. So that deer must have been in that dark timber. The entire week we were hunting there, and at the second day we saw him, he just might have slipped back around, went to that canyon, and went to the dark timber, was just hanging out there until he finally realized, like, hey, this is now the time where I'm actually going to rut. Like, yeah. doing what big bucks do. They don't want to be in open at the time because they're going to get shot or get seen. So he was in that timber. That's why we, and we never glassed in the evening, so I don't know if he was ever showing up there, but like every He's day. Probably, he was probably popping up there. Every yeah, night. probably every night. And so like, checking on those does, and like he actually had a bunch of does near him. And, I, and like all I remember doing in this situation was, I think I think I ranged at first and got a range, so I knew what to uh, adjust my turret to because I, I had a little sight tape marked on the side of all my yardages and MOA. And uh, I think I ranged it at first, and like I knew I could kill him right from here. Like we can kill him right from the cliff. Mm-hmm. And so all I did was throw my backpack down. I didn't even put my bipod down. I just laid my gun on top of the backpack. Cause, like I kind of practice those situations, and I know how to, like do it in a rush. That's why Neville's like, "You do your thing right now. Do whatever you need to do." He grabbed the spotter really quick, put the phone on, and started getting some digiscope footage. And uh, all, uh, I remember, I think it ranged before, like I said, I adjusted the, adjusted the turret, got on the buck, and uh, he's like, I think he said take him, or like, I'm on him, like, you can do whatever you need to. And I, all I remember in the scope, that was the first time I actually got a good look on him, because I just zoomed it all the way in. And uh, all I remember seeing is this giant frame, like the biggest frame I've ever seen in my life. Just like square boxy, going straight up. Like, I don't know what he was, all I know is a giant frame, and it's a deer we have to shoot. Yeah. And, uh, I saw him like do a little lip curl thing towards like a doe and as he turned around just that classic mule deer like everything you want all this snow on the ground all this cold temperatures did your like mind like just immediately just like take a still photo of that like I, I, like n- that no joke that like picture through my rifle scope that i like i can still see it in my head today like, yeah i wish somehow like we could have captured it right there or like maybe i need to like have someone draw it eventually but like that is all I remember is a big giant frame. Like, I don't know how big it is. I saw it's a good deer. That's all yeah. I knew is a good deer. I didn't know if he was a deer from the, from the second day. And uh, so he's like, I know Neville said like he's on him or take him or something like that. And I'm just like trying to settle, settle my gun in there because I don't have my bipod. So I'm like trying to make sure everything's le- level. I put like something behind like the rear of my gun to like, get it super steady. Mm-hmm. I'm just kicking back in the snow. Like there's snow over my backpack now. Just you know get, get all settled in. I squeeze off the shot. And uh, Neville's like, he's down. Like, instant, oh in, in, instantly the deer just, just, just pancakes down. Hit him high shoulder. Oh, my. Perfect. And so I turn to Neville, and I usually don't get really excited. I get either get, like, I just like to be kind of out of myself for a couple seconds. Yeah. Like, I just soak it all in. Like, to me, it's like, I just took an animal. We worked all this time. So, like, to me, it's like a really, like, emotional, personal moment. Like, I don't, like, holler or yell after I, I hit an animal or take an animal down. But Neville, in all his excitement, is doing that right now. So right. I, I couldn't help myself, like, jumping up, give each other a giant hug. He's like, that was awesome. We worked our tail off all week. Like, you earned that deer. And I was like, no, we earned it together. Yep. Like, that was everything. Like, we were just surviving and trying to, you know, live. Like I said, we're living in areas where these animals are, they're, every single day, they're getting stronger and better and faster because they just live here. Like, that's their element. And we're just trying to, th- we're just trying to be a part of that for a little bit of time and just survive in their world well and then i mean like the even just even if you guys just stayed up there for that amount of time and like survived like literally like survived like holy mackerel we made it we lived everybody like that would have been like a huge (laughs) huge thing and you guys just kill an absolute like tanker at the very end tanker of a deer at the very end like the whole week again that like we didn't have insulated boots every day our our feet were numb everything about (sighs) this trip neville like i wanted him to get a deer badly but like he's like, you just need to take this deer right now, and like I'll, I'll I'm glad I was happy to jump down. We still had no clue how big this deer was, but we were all cold, we're all freezing. But we're like, we have to go check him out right away because like I want to see what it is, and it's kind of getting dark. So we're like, all right, I'm gonna take a couple pictures on my cell phone so I can like reference it because I'm just gonna get dark by the time I get over there. Yeah. So I took a bunch of pictures, marked a waypoint right where I was, kind of like did the whole yardage thing, marked a waypoint roughly where I thought the, the deer was. Mm-hmm. And uh, Neville dropped some stuff at, back at camp. I unloaded some of my stuff too because we were gonna, you know, quarter the deer up, bring some, bring some of the hide, the rack back to the thing, and just hang the meat down there because that, that was gonna be the route we'd have to take later on. Neville's like, "You kill this deer, we're done. Yeah. Like we're not gonna hunt the next day. Like this is it. Like we're gonna go home because I think we had, like I said, a day left." 
and uh, so we'll just hang the meat there and then pick up the meat and go out that way. So we had unload a little bit of our gear, started walking down through there. I, all the stuff I remember, I kept looking at that picture. I'm like, okay, he's in some oak brushy areas. He's in here. He dropped down. And I remember, like, I was vis I visually did see him through my binos that he was there. Like, well, we couldn't find him at first, though. Oh, my God. <laughs> so we're like, are we in the like, right Are we in the right area? Dude, like, the ups and downs of this did, is just, like, off the charts. Did he do that thing where he, he got knocked down but didn't get hit hard and... Yeah. Like got up and we were like making all that noise or what we, you know, cause you always yeah. hear people like jump up and celebrate too soon when they should stay on the gun. Yeah. But like I said, I, I remember seeing him before we left. He was there. I'm like, maybe he's a little bit lower on the mountain. Maybe he's a little bit higher. So we start like gridding this whole area where we think he is. Neville hasn't seen anything. Cameron guys hasn't seen anything. All of a sudden I, I like walk over a little bit. I'm like, guys, there he is. Like I see it. I see a rack in the snow. I'm like, all right, come over here before I walk up because like this is going to be a cool moment, I think. And we had no clue what the deer was. I walk over and still to this day, like I picked up his rack. His whole rack was buried in the snow. His face is buried in the snow. Half his body is buried in the snow. Like there's deep snow right there. Yeah. And I just pick him up out of some like the sagebrush and brush. And his rack just kept getting bigger and bigger as I started grabbing it up. And like all of a sudden, like he has an inline. He has like a big like six inch inline on one of the tines. The mass is just unreal. And I was like, this is the biggest deer I've ever taken in my entire life. And I was like, we did it. We yeah. survived it. Everything and like I said, that the the, the 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 visual of me picking it up and snow falling off it, and it's grabbing it and turning the rack for the first time and like, I'm like grabbing my hands like going out wide because it's like a giant wide deer, massive, like just bladed. I think it, I do think it was that that buck we saw that second day uh -huh. before we made the decision to go hike and go backpack, and like to have everything work together, like work out like it did. We froze our butts off. You know, Neville almost got frostbite. We both. Like, like, so later on, I was jumping ahead a little bit. Like, I literally couldn't feel my toes for three months afterwards. Like, I would scratch, like, you know, like, you just, like, take your socks and, like, scratch on the carpet yeah. a little bit. You can, like, feel it. I could not feel that for three months after this hunt. I literally thought my toes were gone. Did you go to the doc and be like, hey, doc, like, I'm having a, a toe issue here? No, but I, I actually called my mom. And uh, <laughs> my mom did some, like, you know, like, moms do, like, magic, like, witch voodoo thing. Like, oh, yeah, you got to go get this, like this like salt type stuff where you can like put in the water and like stick your feet in there. And I'm like, this is kind of right. weird. But she's like, no, trust me. It'll, it'll like make your feet feel, feel better. So I started doing that and actually started getting some like feeling back in my feet. But like, like a week later, again, I'm jumping away ahead, but a week later I went to another hunt where I actually like, stayed in a hotel with my dad and my brothers. I was taking them to Montana. They're like, you should probably go down to the, uh, see if they have a hot tub down there and stick your feet in there. I tried to stick my feet in there and instantly I had to pull them out. Like, Oh really? Hurt. Like hurt super so sensitive, super sensitive, hurt so bad. So like, that whole part of it, like not having insulated boots, freezing, like I would give anything to kill a deer like that. That, like to me, having my feet go numb and maybe not having a feeling in like a foot for a while, that was totally worth it. Yeah. Like I would do that any day of the week. Yeah. Like I want to, I want to obviously have a good hunt. I want to take a big deer because I like hunting old, mature deer. And again, taking that deer in that situation after we struggled in the whole week and like not seeing the deer at first when we started walking down to it and then grabbing its rack and I never knew what it was. I didn't know how big it was. All I saw was that big frame. I didn't know if right. it was a 160 inch deer with the big frame, 180 or 200 inch deer. And then after we started like, you know, we, we took a ton of pictures. I took some cell phone pictures that actually looked the best. Cause it was like, it was back in the day when there was no cell phones, didn't have wide angle lenses or anything. It was just a normal one lens can thing. And that mm -hmm. was actually like one of the better pictures. The deer looks absolutely ginormous and it's a real true photo. And like, I can't believe how big this deer is. Like, yeah, this no deer is, crazy, like, forced perspective No angles. forced perspective. Like, like, this deer is absolutely giant. Everything about this deer is cool. And then right there, we're like, guys, it's getting really cold out again. And we just knocked this deer down. Yeah, camp is just up the hill a little bit, but it's, like, up a big cliff. And you have to walk all around. So, like, we got we to cut this deer up. And I was saying I'm going to do a shoulder mount on him. So I'm, like, taking very good care of the cape as I'm cutting it up. And uh, we made the, the biggest fire of the trip. <laughs> Literally... <laughs> right next to the deer like sometimes, I, sometimes I was like are we cooking the deer here because well, it's so close to it but like we're constantly walking over we're warming our hands up going back over cutting a bunch of meat up and that was like you were going to cut your deer up with your gloves on I'm like yeah i'm not taking my hands out of these gloves like i had some like thinner like shooting type gloves like yeah. i'm gonna grab the meat and cause I, it's gonna be cold and like i had a bunch of my camera gear sitting there because i always pack a you know big camera like taking photos from memories and I walked back to my camera at one point because we started using Neville's camera for a while. And, like, obviously the camera guys, my camera was just, like, iced over. Just from, like, sitting there while we were cutting it up, just, like, completely iced over. Just, like, 
cutting up that whole deer. I had that giant bonfire. We got so many cool like photos and video of me cutting up a deer right next to the fire. And it's not like one of those like things where like force like I want to try to like take these cool photos. Like we needed that fire next to that deer mm-hmm. to stay warm. And then like hung, hung up all that meat in the tree. And I, and I was like, Are you can hang that rack up in the tree. And I was like, no, that rack's coming with us. It's going <laughs> in the teepee tonight. I am not letting that rack out of my sight. Like, I still had a hide on it. And then we brought it up there. And he's like, you really going to sleep with that thing tonight? And I was like, I, I might hang it in the tree right behind camp. But you- I mean, dude, seriously, the way this hunt is going, like, I swear, like, if you hung it in the tree, like, you'd, like, get back there and you'd see, like, an owl fly in. And, like, yeah. like oh, I'm going to take that. And you know, yeah, it was, like, like, my biggest fear. Like, is, is a coyote going to be able to reach up and grab the hide and tear it up? Or, like, but it was, like, right next to camp. Or, like, so you guys know I sleep through anything. So if an animal comes in and tries to get that, or I was like, even in my head, I was like, is someone going to see this big deer in the, in the morning? Because we're probably going to sleep in because mm-hmm. we're really exhausted and like see that rack and want to snag it or something. I'm like, hunters don't do that. Like, but it's like, this is my biggest deer I've ever taken. So it's like my most prized possession at this point. Like, and so like, now I was like, now let's just hang in the tree. And I'm like, oh, I'll hang in the tree. But I said, you got to wake me up. If anything comes into <laughs> camp tonight, like, I'm going to run out there and I don't care if it's a mountain lion. Like I'm going to face to face, like duel with that thing. And uh, luckily, yeah, nothing happened to my deer, but it was like a thought and process in my head. We slept, you know, we had the fire going again. We had a bunch of fires outside that night, like just like soaking everything up. And then the next day we wake up and just like awesome scenery. Cause like everything's now frosted over again. Cause it was so cold, all the snow is still there. You know, I'm starting to cut up my, my skull a little bit, kind of process it more for the tax. And we're trying to lose some weight. So I don't have to carry everything out. And then uh, as we hike out, we did the same thing. We always talk about like, that was like, are you cold? And I'm like, I'm still really, really cold right now. I'm frozen. And then we sit down and he's like, uh, what do you think about right now? And I'm like, the dirtiest freaking burger, pizza, <laughs> anything we can think of right now. And I was like, I just want water. I want water. Like you start appreciating the little things in life, like turning on a faucet and I get water. Yep. You don't have, we didn't have that for the full week we were out there. It's like the little things, like I miss going to a faucet, making that water hot or making it cold. Like I always like, I'm like, I'm never going to take water for granted again. I'm going to drink so much water when I get out of the mountains and just make sure I'm really hydrated because, like, every day we have to think about water. We have to think about, like, the warmth of a fire. We have to think about not sweating, like. Literally, and, like, basic survival Basic survival needs. the whole entire time. And so, like, it was just a super cool experience having everything like that go on, all the ups, all the downs, taking the biggest deer of my life. It's like. Like, I had taken a one, like, deer over 200 inches before that, and this one just, like, dwarfs that. It's like you know 204 and 6 eighths just like an absolute stud of a deer like i couldn't ask for anything better and like a cool place and sharing that with neville yes he didn't kill a deer which definitely hurt me but he was like i didn't need to kill a deer for that that hunt was everything we wanted and you killed the giant and this was like the area you scouted so he was like he's really happy for him but i still wish he would have killed the deer but i was like man that's hunt that you will remember we both will remember forever just everything about it i mean that that i mean you think about that like had it been like in like an easy hunt where he just like walked into like that but i mean it'd be cool he'd be like this dude awesome we got a big one right yeah but like literally that is although a little bit death defying and a little bit frightening and like that's gonna be tough to top man it's gonna be really tough to top like, like the, the ups and downs the, the perseverance sticking with it Yep. probably at some times when maybe you know smarter not to yep uh, and then, you know, coming out on top and having that be the biggest buck of your life. The biggest buck of my life. And, I, I, and again, I didn't know it was that big, too, which makes it even cooler. You always hear about those stories. You're like, oh, yeah, you. most people know what they're shooting. Like, obviously, I knew it was a deer. I knew it was a good rack, but I had no clue it was that big. Yeah. No clue at all. And then, yeah, you you and Neville together. And, I mean, I, I, I mean, a suffer fest like that and, that and persevering through it and doing it together and, and helping each other out. I mean, that creates a brotherhood that and, and nobody can touch. Nobody can touch. I mean, we continue to that. That's why we still like to hunt together all the time. It's like, yeah, like we know how each other hunts. We know what each other's strengths. What some, we don't have, a, I, don't, I don't think we have a lot of weaknesses, but we know like where we lack in certain things. Like obviously I always don't you know, bring a lot of food. Neville brings a lot of food. So I know like if I'm starting to run out a little bit, I bet Neville will give me some more food, you know, <laughs> right. or my whole like, you know, I don't bring a lot of toilet paper, that sort of thing. But like we both can share each other's ideas and things. And like and the whole thing to me too is like it, it hammered home the point of me about like how I hunt mule deer too. Cause like I had a plan going into it. I wanted to hunt high. I wanted to get away from people. I want to hunt deer on their terms during that time of year. Yeah, it, it was hard. Yeah, it's, it sucked a lot, but there were still deer above 10,000 feet in November. I want to prove myself that. 
Yeah. Because I've always seen deer do that and heard about that. And like, never heard a lot of people talking about hunting that way, but it was like, they had everything they needed there. They had a little pocket where they were hidden every single day that probably got enough snow where they had some feed right there. And that big buck, like I said, we maybe we caught him on a rare day where he came out away from that timber patch that was on that rim rock cliff. But he was still there every single day, just being an old buck, being smart, mm-hmm. being cautious, and knew that those elk hunters who were over there, they never came over this little area. There's maybe maybe there was no elk there, but like it was hard to get to. Like there's no roads to get to that spot. Like everything about it, just like, all right, I think I know. Like I, I add another piece to my mule deer puzzle. Yeah, and a little, a little toolkit type thing to like my strategy, my thought process, and like, all right, this was this was worth it. It's gonna be one for the ages. That's so cool, man. Yeah, was, I mean, obviously a reason that deer was there and why he got old and he why he old. was like a true monarch of the mountain. And yeah. You know, you, you wonder even in your mind, like, how many people have even seen that deer? Yeah, exactly. Maybe just you guys. I know. And, and it was like, I think, too, like, yeah, like, I'm just trying to stretch it a little bit, but it's like, it was a drought year as well. So, like, what would that deer have been if it was a non-drought year? Would he be been even bigger? Like, I don't know. This deer is just a monarch of the mountain. That's why I think mule deer are always the coolest thing. You never know what you're going to get when you're hunting mule deer. You can see deer every day. You can have a suffer fest. Like, it's the most addicting hunt in the world. Dude, that's so cool, man. Oh, my gosh. Like, seriously, that was like a riveting tale. It's just ups, ups, downs, downs, bad things downs. happen all the time. Just like you never know. But uh, definitely one of, the, one of the cooler hunt stories I've heard. Appreciate you taking the time to tell it and share it. And I'm glad you guys got home safe and you're better hunters for it. And, and my feet are not uh, numb anymore. Actually, can have, I have a lot of feeling in my feet And now. you've got your feeling back. So there's yep. just a lot I, to celebrate. I, I think it's going to hurt me the next time I go in that same environment. They'll probably get a lot cold really quick. But yep. yeah, it was, it was all worth it. It was such an expanding experience. Totally worth it. Totally worth it. So awesome. Thank you, Brady. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Awesome story. Awesome deer. Uh, love, love to hear about it. I think people could actually, they might be able to watch some of that. Yes? Yes, yes. That's definitely on our YouTube channel. That hunt's called uh, Below Zero. For, for, for good reasons, it's called Below Zero. Yeah. It should be called be like Below Below Zero. Below like below double, zero. double Below Zero. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's one of my favorite hunts of all time. It's, it's, a cool, it's a cool thing, especially when you watch it and you hear the backstory. Because a lot of stuff isn't portrayed in the film because it's even our camera guys up there trying to survive. Like, right. He's, he's having a hard time even filming and batteries are, getting, are dying all the time. So it's, like, it's hard, it was a hard hunt to capture correctly. Mm-hmm. But I think we put it together really well. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, again. Take care. We'll catch you on the next one. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.